but I forget to change the title page because you know I, I copy and paste <laughs> the PowerPoint uh, from time to time. Uh, in fact, I would start talking a little bit about poverty and then poverty policy, and then go to and then go to the point about intergeneration poverty and social mobility. Okay, uh, but because whenever we talk about uh, social mobility and talking about uh, intergeneration poverty, we, we have to start from the basic thing about what it is related to poverty, and then what are we doing right now in the present moment? Have some idea of. Uh, a picture of what is going on uh, right now. Um, so I'll be quick on, on some of the basic things. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time about, uh, but as an academic, I, I will start always with uh, definition. <laughs> so, so what are we talking about about poverty? Well, uh, we don't talk about absolute poverty in Hong Kong. Although when we look at the globe and we look around, we talk about absolute poverty, particularly we talk about 1.25 US dollars a day uh, around the globe, like in Africa, in uh, South America, it's still uh, a big issue, even part of China is still an issue. Uh, but we talk more about relative poverty. I'm not going to de uh, go through the, the, the definition of all those things. Uh, but the last part is really uh, uh, what we're probably talking a bit more in Hong Kong, is how it's related to others, relative to others. It can be uh, relative to the social de development conditions, but that is not we really, are uh, going to talk more uh, in the future, particularly in the context of the commi uh, commission on poverty. So it's about relative to to a, a preference. This is always used uh, quite internationally widely. Is the median household income. So we'll be talking about a percentage of median household income as a basic reference about uh, poverty. Uh, the um, the, the European Union use uh, the 60 percent. Okay, uh, OECD use 30 percent of the medium household income as the the, the poverty line. Uh, you, if you read the news in Hong Kong, you probably know that uh, the 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 Commission on Poverty will likely will take on the 50 percent as the po official poverty line. It, it doesn't mean a lot in terms of policy. But it's a, it, the, the, the poverty line is used for primary two purposes. One is for evaluating effectiveness of policy in, uh, in alleviating uh, a poverty. The second purpose is to draw a line somehow. And then you analyze who, who are the people who are behind, below the line. Who, who are those people? Uh, particularly, we'll look at, in the future, look at, look at uh, before the government does anything? Uh, who are the people below the poverty line? After the government has uh, 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 those transfer programs, social welfare, education, etc., etc., who else is still remaining below the poverty line? Who they are and why they're still there? In the poverty line. So these are the, the is the analysis analytical tool for government making policy. So that is the poverty line you know, in the future we're talking about, and it's basically relative. Uh, um, in, in Hong Kong, in, in Chinese, we, we use the term and it, it is very confusing in Chinese because we actually don't know what is referring to. There are two different concepts. One is, in, in English, it will be wealth gap and income disparity. They're two different things. In, in Chinese, Panfu can be either measured by wealth or measured by income. For those accountants, you will put any accountants there. Uh, income is the measure of the flow of revenue, uh, net expenses or whatever you define it, uh, in a period of time. Well, wealth is a measure of value at a particular point of time. Okay, it's a point of time. Uh, basically, the accounts will be like balance sheet versus uh, uh, the income statement. So, so are two, two very different things. And the the concept of wealth is difficult because it's very difficult to collect good data on wealth. When you go to a household, interview the husband. When the wife is, be, is near him, it's very difficult for the husband to tell the truth about his wealth. Similarly for the wife, okay? They keep their own personal secrets. And in fact, we have tried twice in Hong Kong, tried to collect information about wealth of the elder, 
because it used to describe the elderly as public, they can be asset rich, and yet their income poor. But then we try to trace uh, the, the census statistics department. We try to ask them to do the third time uh, recently, but then the answer is that in the last two times, we're, we're very doubtful about the quality of data we have. And secondly, our interviewer is scolded by the elderly from time to time. Because they will say, why are you asking all those sensitive information okay, uh, about wealth? Okay? People are more used to telling people about their income rather than telling people wealth. In fact, I would have difficulty to tell you my wealth. How much I have right now is a very difficult thing. I probably have to work for another at least uh, half an hour to find out what is the current market value or whatever I have. Okay, which is very, in fact, very difficult. Okay, particularly if you have stocks, you have real estate, it will be very difficult to tell you about that. So, whenever we talk about disparity, it's primarily income disparity most of the time because we have good quality information. Although income is not very accurate anyway. Okay, when you ask people about the income, depending on the circumstances, at times they will overshoot a little bit, at times they will underreport a little bit. Okay, it depends on the circumstances. But it's still better than well. So internationally we have income disparity information. Okay? And that's why when you measure poverty, well mostly we will use income as a proxy. If you have wealth, we will reasonably expect your wealth will generate income. So at the end if you measure income, so it will be a much better proxy about about uh, poverty. Uh, so when we, when we talk about, the reason I have to talk a little bit about income disparity is because the idea of poverty is relative. And relative poverty has a lot to do with income disparity. Okay? There, there are a, a quite a number of reasons why income disparity is increasing. Uh, I mentioned just two, which is global. Firstly is the wealth gap is increasing. Although we don't have data, uh, direct data about wealth, but then from other proxies, we know that the wealth gap is getting wider and wider. Simply, if you look at, like, the uh, stock market, in the past 25 years, the average value of stock increases in Hong Kong and in the United States is around 7.4 to 7.6% 7, 7 per year. If you look at the past 40 years, it's even bigger, it's like 9%, okay? Past 25 years, it's like 7.4 to 7.6% 7 annual per annual growth. Real wages only increase by 2.4%. So there's always a gap between earned income and income generated from wealth. Because wealth is growing like over 7%. In fact, number seven percent has disregard dividend already, exclude dividend already. So that seven percent, which basically you will have approximately five percent difference of income generated from wealth and income generated from earning, working. So that gap is growing quicker, bigger, and bigger over time. Okay, it's like every eleven year, the gap is double. Okay? That that is what we are facing in terms of uh, wealth and also income. And it's uh, the, the basic analysis, it is a Marxist analysis on, on the factor share of production. Uh, the, the, if you look at product productivity and look at capital uh, share, is actually the factor is increasing and the labor share is reducing. And, and you know because productivity, because of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, computerization and, 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 and also of the technological advance, the labor share drops and the capital grows. Okay, the share of the production. The other fact is globalization. I, I, I don't think I have to spend time on the impact of globalization on, on uh, income disparity. Uh, but in Hong Kong, we have other factors. Uh, the, the first factor is land as a factor of production. It's increasing. You, you need buildings, you need land in order to produce anything, surface or products. And Hong Kong, particularly in terms of urban land, the past 40 years has been increasing every year on average 10 to 11 percent. But there are fluctuations, of course. But then you take the average for the past 40 years, every year the land appreciate, the value of land appreciation of urban land in Hong Kong is around 10 to 11 percent. So it's rising very rapidly. 
So the cost of production due to land has been increasing to a very significant proportion. And probably everybody in Hong Kong knows that because of rent and, and, and that sort of thing is increasing. Housing shortage is a, is, is, is a big problem. Those who have who, who own a house and those versus those who, who, who do, does not own a house, their disparity is growing over time. Uh, the other factor is Hong Kong, we have a rapid increase in, in part-time workers. Um, and that has a lot of things to do with uh, family disintegration. Uh, uh, we have more and more female task, uh, 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 labor force in, in the part-time work. In 10 years' time, it's more than, more than triple. If you look at the, the number of part-time workers, particularly female, so that is because of their, uh, that's basically two, two reasons, smaller families and also uh, high divorce rate, uh, more and more single parent families, and uh, they cost a lot of uh, part time workers. Okay? Uh, even for male, uh, male single parents, male head of single parent families, the, the, uh, the labor participation is 70%, whereas the same age cohort will be approximately 19%. And uh, the female is around 30 percent of the participation rate versus around 50 to 70, depending on the age cohorts of the labor participants. So, so we have uh, 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 both in terms of labor participation rate and also in terms of part-time work is, has been increasing. Now, a rapid increase in elderly-only households. In the past 10 years, the, the single, 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 single elderly household is doubled in the past 10 years. In terms of two elderly households, is uh, increased by around one third. Okay? So, so elderly only household, basically when you measure income, their income will be lower and lower in, if you compare to 10 years ago. The other factor, very few people talk about demographics, so I, I mentioned a little bit about uh, 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 demographics. Age distribution and uh, Large education uh, attainment differences across age cohort is one of the reasons of increasing income disparity. Uh, for the education attainment across age cohorts, is primarily uh, the difference between the, the adult group, young adult group versus the already retired group. Okay, our, our, our 65 plus, uh, 30 percent of them are illiterate. Okay, and, and and basically, which basically reflect they have a very low income throughout their lifetime. And, and that's why they don't accumulate much wealth uh, at the, at the, after retirement. And, and therefore, the age income disparity, one factor is really we have a very relatively poor elderly population. So that is the uh, education attainment across the age groups. Uh, the age difference, particularly one thing is, perhaps I'll show you the, um, this thing. This is the uh, 20, uh, 2011. Two years ago, uh, uh, age pyramid. Okay. Uh, international is the same. Hong Kong, particular. Mid-age household head. Well, I would say mid-age head of households have higher income than younger households. Uh, there's always an average like two percent growth in real wage when one age is over ten. Okay, until you retire. Okay. So, so when you have an age cohort, if you look at this particular age cohort, you will find that the biggest group right now for male is 50 to 54. For female, it's slightly lower, okay? For 45 to 49. This is our current, the biggest uh, uh, of the people. If households are, head of households are headed by this age group, this group will have higher, much higher income than income of those head households headed by something what, 25 to 29 or 30 to 34, okay? This difference of the age distribution account for quite substantially internationally uh, because of the uh, baby boom, the, the uh, 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 issue, because that change in the age pyramid has account for one of the reasons, both locally and internationally, the increase in income disparity. Um, but this is purely demographic, okay? Uh, um, in fact, demographic change can, can make Gini coefficient up to a maximum like 0.5 already by itself, but that's not the case for Hong Kong. Hong Kong have other reasons for have having a high uh, Gini coefficient, uh, but that is more, not only for most countries, purely because of demographics, 
the gene coefficient can be as high as 0 0.2 to 0.25 already, simply by demographic. This is common among developed regions of the world. Other difference will be other fairness issue and, uh, and a labor market issue. Um, if you look at income disparity and then rel relative poverty, uh, for those who know a little bit about uh, statistics like normal curve, okay, you know what is a normal curve look like this, okay. If the income disparity is high, which means this curve is flat, okay. Assuming the middle is the middle, and the, the, the middle is not in the middle, it's slightly left in the middle, but let assume it's in the middle. If you have a flat distribution, 50% of the median, you cut the tail, that tail will be much fatter than an uh, income distribution which is more uh, compact. Right? If a distribution is very compact, instead of very flat, then 50% of the medium, can, there will be very few people. But if there is increasing income disparity in terms of the shape of the curve, it will become flattened gradually, okay? Which basically means 50% of the medium will increase it. That is the reason why at the time 2005 to 2007, you know, I should say in the first meeting of the Commission of Poverty back in 2005, the old Commission of Poverty, they decide not to work on relative poverty because Henry, Henry Tan, understand this logic about relative poverty and income disparity. And he knows that income disparity is going to increase over time. And which basically means if you're simply looking at Gini coefficient, then or looking at 50% of the medium household income then the number of the, or the proportion of people who are poor will be greater and greater. And in Cantonese, it's, it's basically useful. The more you help them, the more people who are poor. It's primarily because of what we call the statistical effect due to increasing inequality. We talk about the poverty. Uh, but then this administration convinced that they can't get, re get away from it. Okay? Uh, and, and decide that uh, it somehow is fair to try to use that poverty line to measure effectiveness of the line. Okay? Uh, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about poverty line, but, but basically uh, that is a, a conceptual and statistical issue whenever we're using relative poverty. Uh, to deal with income disparity is almost the same as the issue of dealing with poverty. If you want to cut the tail, reduce the people who are, who are poor, there are two ways. You just simply move them closer to the middle, okay? which basically means you reduce the income disparity by transferring income from those who are high income groups and put it into the pocket of the low income groups, which basically means you reduce the disparity. So, so in, to reduce income disparity is very much similar to the reduction in poverty, at least in numbers. Okay? There are conceptually only two ways of doing it. One is you target at the income distribution process. How income to distribute? There are the three major mechanisms people around the world use. The first one is they are all labor market thing. Okay? Mostly labor market thing. Minimum wage. Hong Kong, we use minimum wage. Okay? Well, we start at a very low level. It takes a long time uh, even to catch up with inflation. but. But, but, but we, we, we still have a minimum wage. Uh, in many other countries, they use labor market mechanism. For example, collective bargaining. Uh, the, the basic argument for labor market me uh, uh, mechanisms like collective bargaining is because labor has a poorer uh, bargaining power. So without collective bargaining, uh, labor uh, uh, will have a lower bargaining power. Okay? But then there are other uh, kind of thing, uh, argument about the, the, the imperfection of the market and, 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 and so forth. Uh, we have non-market mechanism, okay? State enterprise and operation. In fact, to put it very simple, even in Hong Kong, uh, non-market mechanism can be something like if the government increase the civil servants' pay over above the trend, 
which will have an impact on the wage level across Hong Kong. Okay? If the Hong Kong government starts to, because they have a, it's a significant play in the labor market, if you, if you increase the civil servants' pay, then you will have what we call a cost for inflation, and everybody has to follow, and you have to compete for labor, and so you drive the labor cost up. So in fact, the government can, can use some kind of government intervention to, 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 to make that change. But, but you know the Hong Kong government, uh, Hong Kong SL government, want to keep that civil servant salary adjustment aligned with the market uh, 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 trend. Okay? So basically, we are saying that the government never used that any other non-market mechanism to do with that income distribution. So we only have one, which is the minimum wage. And in fact, in 2011, all statistics, all analysis tell us that, in fact, the minimum wage do have an impact on income disparity and reducing it in the year 2011. But only in 2011 only. Okay? Not last year because we have no revision. This year we have a revision, but that is only $2. And now, which basically just uh, uh, just shut off the uh, uh, inflation. So, so we we'll expect uh, evaluation later on. Uh, that the revision of the minimum wage this year doesn't have any impact at all on our income distribution. So, the other major strategy is dealing with what we call conceptual. It's very simple: redistribution. If you don't work on the income distribution, you work on the redistribution. There are only two ways: tax and then transfer. Okay. You collect money and then you distribute. And in Hong Kong, we have welfare, education, housing, health, and labor. Uh, but this this table is just to tell you that uh, that the trend uh, two o six is 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 quite uh, quite worse. Okay, primarily because uh, uh, you can see increasing number of poor people. Okay, if you compare this figure. Right, 206. But then in 2011, it's getting a little bit better than 206. And as I said, it's primarily due to minimum wage. Okay, This impact is primarily. But if you compare 2011 to 201, uh, the situation is still worse off. Okay, There are more poor people, and there are more rich people, Okay, high income people. So, so it's the, the flatten of the distribution uh, as from 10 years ago. But 206, in fact, the 2011 figures actually show some improvement relative to 2006. Okay, uh, I'm not going to details about the income disparity anymore. But uh, if you're interested, you, we can look back to the July publication last year of the Census Statistics Department. Don't just remember the 0 0.537 figures, which is primarily what we call the pre-tax and pre-transfer figure. If you really want to look at income disparity, you look at the post-tax and post-transfer figure, okay? Which is only about uh, 0.473, okay? So uh, if you look at those analysis, you understand the impact of income redistribution on income disparity. Let me spend a little bit then on, on the existing current poverty alleviation policy. Uh, before the session, I, I mentioned to George that uh, one of the problems we have is we have a very complex system. Okay? And I can actually bet on that. There's hardly anyone in Hong Kong knows all the system well. Okay? The eligibility, the reason they are there, and uh, the possible uh, contradictions and all the possible uh, repetition and uh, this other thing. Okay? The biggest program is the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance, CSSA. Okay? We spent 20 billion okay? uh, in Chinese is in okay? every year. Uh, this is the, uh, this figure 20.4 is the, the budget for this current financial year. Uh, up to the uh, May the 31st, uh, it helps 268,000 people, which accounts for about 11.2% of the households in Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the two, 268 is not number of person, it's number of households. I'm sorry, uh, I forget to put it down. 268,000 households in Hong Kong, which accounts for 11.2% of the households. We have disability allowance, old age allowance. The recent one is the old age living allowance. We spent, this year we're going to spend 
almost the same amount, nineteen billion dollars. The biggest amount is on on uh, OH living allowance. Okay, uh, over seven hundred thousand people uh, uh, receive those allowances, which accounts for nine point eight percent of the population. CSSA and this allowance are exclusive. Okay? Uh, uh, the, you, you, you can't have a disability allowance, OH allowance, at the same time CSSA. So you, you know that somehow around close to 20% of people or households basically are provided this cash allowance. The third biggest one, uh, well, in fact, is the students' assistance programs, which is big, the, the, the biggest one, which uh, uh, actually helps 170,000 families. Uh, uh, it's run by the Student Finance uh, 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 Assistant Agency, in short, SFAA. It, it is uh, the second biggest uh, bureaucracy <laughs> in Hong Kong. <laughs> the biggest one, in fact, is, is, is the uh, Social Welfare Department. Okay? Uh, it has a very big, it has uh, 41 off-field units doing all this CSSA Social uh, Security Assessment. Okay, the biggest bureaucracy is the uh, Social Welfare Department. The SFAA is under the Education Bureau is the second biggest one. It, it actually spent about $5.3 billion just on uh, tax for allowance, uh, various types of grants, and uh, etc. cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. So $5.3 billion for the current company. If you uh, take all this retraining allowance, work incentive, transfer subsidy, etc., etc., it's, it's like more than $6 billion for current financial year. And it has over 220,000 families, okay, which account for another 9.2%. Okay. Now, community heaven is a small one. <laughs> uh, we expect for this financial year to spend about 1 billion to 1.5 billion, okay, for the current year, financial year. Likely we'll be spending that amount. Uh, they come, uh, the CDF is the Child Development Fund. It's a very small one, only 20 million. It's like uh, a small one as compared to CSSA and another thing. And this uh, child development is an initiative of the earlier Commission of Poverty. Okay? Uh, and reason, uh, 20 million is that because uh, Henry Tech at that time was the finance secretary. And there was a new initiative to sell self made car registration number. And the projected revenue from that. Uh, 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 registration number uh, sale is around 20 million a year, and they put into the uh, the, the child development fund. Okay, that was the idea. But in fact, the government didn't earn that much <laughs> on, on the rest, and it's it dropping very rapidly. Uh, anyway, uh, the other policy area is public housing, labor, health, and education. So I'm not going to dwell on it. We have over 200 different items of benefits to citizens in Hong Kong. And I am I can assure you when I read the list, which is compiled by the efficiency unit earlier last year, uh, some of the items I didn't even know that they exist. Okay, and they're actually there. Okay. Uh, so that is a very complex system. Who who are we helping in the existing system? I, I use the monthly median domestic household income. Uh, put it short, is uh, household median household income. Uh, we also say MMDHI in short, okay? Uh, to represent the monthly median domestic household income. Uh, CSSA, uh, PRH is the uh, public uh, rental housing, uh, which is the work incentive transport subsidy. SFAA grants all the different things under the Student Finance System Agency and Medical Waiver System. Okay, if, if you look at all these numbers, uh, you, you will find they're very different. Okay, uh, the the CSSA is for uh, one person is sixty three percent of the median, and two person 45, 40, 39. So the closest number is around forty. On average, is forty forty five point four percent something around that. Okay, of the medium household income. Uh, public rental housing is uh, 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 relatively generous if you compare to CSSA because uh, if you compare the medium household income, one person is 170%, 86, 76, etc. The width is something very similar, okay? slightly lower than the uh, public rental housing. 
we have full grant and half grant under the uh, student finance. Okay, anything up to 147 is interesting. We have single person household who are studying, studying in secondary school, which basically is a, is a child living alone. Okay, <laughs> and definitely somehow for some odd reasons they have this this figure. I, I I still have some doubt about this figure at all because I don't really understand what it really really means. But anyway. Uh, 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 the two-person household and above is around around the median, okay? Which basically means 50% of the households will be able to get some form of at least half grant for students in the secondary and primary school. Which basically uh, we have two types of uh, uh, grants in, in those uh, three types of grants. I will talk about uh, uh, one of them later on. Uh, so full grant is slightly over 50%, around 60 something. Uh, the medical waiver is the simplest system. It's fifty percent the median uh, for full waiver, and then for those who are at seventy-five percent or below, will have a half waiver for medical fees. But you know the medical fees already nominal already. Okay, forty forty-seven dollars for outpatient clinic, and sixty dollars for special uh, outpatient clinic, and a hundred dollars for the day hospital and uh, uh, emergency service. Okay, it's already nominal, and uh, but for chronic patients, it, uh, it can be quite substantial because they have more than one drug, so they have to pay different drugs, and because the SOPD uh, payment can be very substantial when they have to have uh, repeated visits to the hospitals. But anyway, so this gives you some idea who are we helping. Uh, Hundred percent of the median basically means fifty percent of the households. Okay. Okay, whenever we talk about poverty, we get two issues. It's basically human dignity and social uh, social justice. This just just pictures we've seen from time to time, the cash loans, the cash and, 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 and elderly pick up all those uh, papers, the tunes. Uh, so we, we know that poor population is uh, elderly households, people with disability, uh, for because of caring role they have to leave the labor market and so they have lower income, uh, low education, low skill, middle age, uh, because of uh, relatively, uh, because uh, people age like 45 or above, at the time they will probably only have six year compulsory education. Okay? It's for those 50, 45 or below who will have nine years. Now it's 12 years. Okay? New arrivals and ethnic minority. Ethnic minority there's vast difference between different types of uh, ethnic minority. A European, we don't con even don't even think about Europeans when we talk about ethnic minority. We mostly talk about South uh, 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 Asians, uh, and primarily is uh, uh, Pakistanis. Uh, for Indians, the poverty rate is very low; it's only a, a, like four to five percent. But for those coming from or origin of Pakistan, the poverty rate is something close to thirty something. It's very high, very high among uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, in, in terms of intervention, we have societal level and uh, we have local neighborhood level, we have individual level. We all, we, we'll come back to some of the individual levels later on. Um, overall strategy, I'm not talking about specific measures. Uh, the, the quickest way is to try to to provide things, either in time or in cash. Okay? There are only two ways. Okay? Education, training, employment, so it is primarily in, in time. Social in, insurance is primarily in cash. Okay? Uh, so at the same time, you need, uh, uh, they have, for people who are unemployed, uh, they need some financial support, and yet they, have, they need some support to look for jobs. So it can be both in time and in cash. And whenever we talk about poverty alleviation, we have to build on uh, leverages, which basically mean you can't just be anywhere around the world. You can't be just be around the government to tackle the issue of poverty. It needs the whole society to do that. So we, we, we used to talk about leverage on business sector and civil society organizations to do the job. And innovations. Uh, today, I, 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 I won't have time to talk about uh, social innovations. Uh, somehow, uh, in, in, in this world, 
uh, the word innovation is always a positive word. Uh, but we used to innovate by learning from others. Okay? <laughs> well, in, particularly in Hong Kong, uh, we learned a lot from other places, both from the success stories and failures. So, so, so we, when we, we basically innovate on the basis of experience that people have and, and put into our contacts and see what are the ways that we can uh, deal with it. Okay? Uh, this is my recommendation. Are there, are, there, are there any media people here around? Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, but anyway, I, <laughs> this is my, my own recommendation. So don't take it as a commission positive thing or the government way. Okay. The whole, because of the complexity of the, of, of the system, uh, no one in the administration actually knows about all these things. And uh, it's so difficult to grasp. I, I can assure whenever we discuss uh, uh, poverty alleviation policy, there's always something that we left out in our mind that can be, uh, that have implications like repetitions, contradictions, and also read across effects. These are the three key issues we always miss out. Uh, we miss out that uh, some of the things, oh, or that actually uh, something is already there. Uh, we, 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 we forget about something. Okay? They can be duplications. Uh, the duplications can be both public and also private initiatives. Because there's still a lot of NGOs, uh, charities are doing something like that. And so whenever you think about public measures, you have to think about how you leverage on the private initiative uh, uh, and make use of one another instead of one replacing another. So, so that is a challenge whenever uh, there's, there's hardly anything new in this world whenever you talk about alleviation of poverty. But then, how, how you can make sure that public action will not drive, so to speak, the private action is also a, a thing that we have to think very carefully in, in terms of design and interfaces. So it is very complicated. And uh, I, I'm an advocate about system integration uh, because if we have thousands of people doing income tests, income assessment, means tests, all this kind of thing, thousands and thousands of people doing it. And hardly anyone, even for those who are needy, they do not know uh, what exactly out there they will be entitled to. Okay? Uh, there are always something that people miss. They're entitled to, and yet they don't know that they're entitled to. And it's happening uh, in Hong Kong all the time. So system integration is something that is very important, but it's tremendously challenging. System in purchase, and uh, it is very difficult to integrate bureaucracies. How would you able to integrate the system of the uh, uh, student finance and the CSSA system? Uh, how can you integrate the, the work incentive uh, uh, transfer subsidy system with the student finance? Okay? A, a family can be receiving uh, uh, many different benefits. Okay? And here and now, we actually don't possess the information how much each individual family is obtaining from the government. Okay? Matching data set is a pain, and it's also a privacy issue, but but uh, uh, theoretically, we can always get uh, get around the PTC issue. And uh, uh, the um, but then the major issue is incompatible data set, incompatible architecture, incompatible workflow, and, and and all those things. And it's very difficult and challenging. And and yet we have to start working on it. Uh, this is in our CYLM uh, uh, election platform. Okay, <laughs> system integration, but it's terribly challenging. Meanwhile, we have to do what we call step-by-step -step or incremental to strengthen the support to low-income families. Okay? The two type of families. Uh, the reason I mentioned these two type of families is because there are little controversies in Hong Kong about their needing more help. One is families with children. No one would disagree with them. Okay? Children is our next generation. We talk about uh, 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 this uh, uh, cross-generation or, or transgeneration, whatever you call it, poverty issue, okay? And then also working families. Uh, 
the people who work long hours, and yet their income is not sufficient to raise our family. Although we have minimum wage, well, the minimum wage can support individuals, but not the whole family. So uh, we would want to encourage people to work more uh, in order to earn more. But then how to, can you encourage them to work and yes, yes at the same time helping them? It, it's, it's a challenge. Okay? So step by step, uh, we, we already have this working family supplement here in Hong Kong, which is the work incentive transport subsidy, which basically is a working family supplement. Okay? Uh, in the application of the, uh, uh, the, the work incentive transport subsidy, all you have to say that I need to take transport. It's a box, the ticket and declare that you need to take transport and you get the trans transport subsidy. Okay, there's no need to prove you, whether you, you walk, you, you, you travel by tram, or you travel by taxi, or whatever. All you have to say is that I need to travel, and you got the transport subsidy. Okay, so, so basically it's a working family subsidy. Uh, we have a lot of subsidy for families with children already under the student financing. Okay? But we, they, we, they're still far from adequate in providing sufficient support. So what we need to do is to strengthen at least these two systems. The alignment of eligibility standards. In the PowerPoint earlier one, uh, uh, slide, you uh, show that all the different levels of eligibility for different programs. It's very complex, okay? It's only me who, when compiling that table, knows it at that moment. Tomorrow, I probably will forget about what they are already, because they are all, all very difficult to remember. So we need some alignment, okay? But we always have to bear in mind, different policy have different objectives. So the eligibility can be very different, okay? Like the issues, when, uh, like another system I haven't mentioned in the PowerPoint is like Samaritan Fund. Samaritan support uh, people to buy uh, uh, particular drugs, okay? Which is not on the standard list of the hospital authority. They can be very expensive. They can be ten, tens of thousands of dollars per month, okay? And uh, so because it's, the drugs are very expensive, so even middle class people can find it very difficult to buy those drugs. Uh, 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 and uh, some of those drugs are so expensive. So it's the, in the, within our uh, Samaritan fund uh, system, basically we help people well above the median, okay? Well above, it's over 150%. Uh, the method of calculation is different, but if you convert those numbers into a uh, percentage of medium household income, it will go over 150% of the median. Okay? So it really depends on the policy and the implications of those expenses. Uh, we need an over, we, have, we need a revamping of our retirement protection system. Uh, we have the CSSA providing some, some form, we have the OH allowance, we have the OH living allowance, we have the NPF. Uh, but they are not add together still far from sufficient. So we need to revamp the whole thing. Uh, Nelson Chow is uh, performing, doing a study on that part. We hope to submit a report by, they will submit the report by December. So we will start working on those revamping of the retirement protection starting from next year. And for people with disability, we need multiple helping hands. Uh, because they have special needs, and they need different types of uh, support, and also for healthcare. And uh, for CSSA, it's a very big system. Uh, I, I personally do not recommend an overhaul of the CSSA system uh, because uh, it's, it's like big element. And uh, there's so many stakes, stakeholders in it. And, uh, and, and, and the over revamping of the system can be very costly at the end of the day because everybody will have like, whenever you go to the uh, uh, we visit the system, it's like a Christmas tree, and everybody hangs their dishes on it. Uh, and so the system is becoming more and more complex. So, so the best strategy is to strengthen support system outside the CSSA system, particularly low-income families. In fact, there are a lot of low-income families, they are at a level even worse than the CSSA level, and they are not receiving sufficient help. So, so it is moral, morally right to spend more time and effort trying to help those outside the CSSA net first before you improve the CSSA system. Although, 
that 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 quite a number of uh, uh, small things that we need to improve on the CSS system. We are, we are doing that uh, uh, right now at the moment. Uh, but then, whenever when we when we think about the CSS system, our our, our problem is like this: uh, the CSS system is far from perfect. We need to improve it. And in fact, some of the support to those families are not sufficient. But then, whenever we improve the CSS system. We make the CSSA system more secure and more attractive, and it's very getting more and more difficult for people to leave the CSSA system, particular families with chronic patients, because if you're on the CSSA system, you are sure that you have free medical services, free public medical services. But once you leave the CSSA system, the fee waiver system is a bit challenging for a lot of families. And that, that is one of the prime reasons. Some of the families still stay on the CSSA primarily for one reason. It's a medical family. Okay? That makes it very difficult, particularly for elderly, particularly for families, younger families if they have a chronic patient. It's very difficult. So changes in the CSSA, I personally only recommend incremental changes. Because there's some, some logical things that is in, in, in uh, well, I would say, it doesn't make sense at all. Like for example, uh, at the present moment, the CSSA doesn't consider having a telephone line is essential. It's only essential for people who are 70 or above and living alone. Okay, you imagine what does it really mean today? Okay, don't even. But but the, but the interesting thing is that while telephone is not essential in CSSA, internet access for children is essential. Okay. It looks very inconsistent because once you have a, a, a internet access, you can have a telephone. Okay, okay. This is this IP phone uh, kind of thing. You already have that. Okay, so it's very inconsistent with our CSSA system. We need some kind of uh, uh, recently. In fact, they 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 find out one thing. Well, it's not defined one thing. Uh, uh, they actually know it within the CSSA system. Is that for 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 families so on CSSA, if the children go to say college, university, okay, under the current system, they will leave the CSSA system and they under the SFAA system to have the grant and loan. Grant look after the school related expenses and the loan look after the daily expenses. But then, in the formula of working out the loan, housing <coughs> is not considered. Which basically assumes nowhere that this needed young people have a housing need. Okay? They are out from CSSA system, the house CSSA system take care of the housing need. They have a rent allowance within the CSSA system. The SFAA loan has no in the formula there's no housing. Practically all of them are living together with the family. But because they are discounted from the family, their rent allowance of the family drops. Because the rent allowance state for family of four is higher than the family of three. But once the the person leaves the system, a four person household becomes a three person household and therefore they have a rent allowance reduction. But then the person is actually still living in it. Uh, so we're going to resolve that uh, 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 inconsistency within uh, the interface of system. Okay? We'll probably work on the CSSA rather than on the SFAA uh, uh, system. Uh, Let's come back to the intergenerational poverty. Okay? There are two issues related to intergenerational poverty. The first one is the social upward mobility. Social upward mobility is essential, particularly for a capitalistic society, because hope is very important to keep the society stable, <laughs> which is fundamental. Without social mobility, the, the, the people, if they have no hope at all, their, their grievance towards the system will be higher and higher. In fact, we are now facing these circumstances, particularly among the younger population, because the sense of hope is hardly there. Uh, they, they have been working for five to ten years, and, and they're still stuck with the same therapy. Okay? Promotion prospect is, is, is beyond somewhere. We don't know where. Okay? So, so social upward mobility has a very important stabilizing effect on capitalist society, particularly for younger generations. The second issue is ego opportunity. 
particularly for children of low-income families. Okay? Let's look at the uh, uh, reducing of uh, social mobility. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to tell you the details of those studies, uh, but the, the basic thing, uh, Jane's study is, uh, is useful academically, but not quite useful politically or in mm -hmm. terms of policy. Because it uses a concept about, uh, uh, which is, uh, I, I label, it's my, my label term, it's called relative social mobility. Which basically means that people moving up and the people moving down. Okay? Because what he is trying to measure is how people move across different uh, quartiles. Okay? From the lowest quartile, second quartile, third quartile. And whenever the people moving from one quartile up, which means there are people moving down. Because they are always equal numbers. Okay? The distribution is equal. So, so it's a relative concept. Okay? But conceptually, it's still useful in, in an academic sense because uh, it, it actually tells you the, the rate of mobility creates hope. Because if you go, if you drop down, if your, if your mobility is going down, but the, when there are opportunities for you to move up again, it's still hope. Okay? So high the mobility, even for relative mobility, is positive impact on, on the societal stability. Uh, and, and that is from uh, 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 from Lingnan College uh, a University. Uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, more, slightly more than a year ago, he, he, he reported on a study on the rate of income increase for different age cohorts differs. Uh, he is comparing the, the, the post 60s to 70s to 80s and, and, and see how in 10 years time the income change over time, historically. And, and uh, the evidence is clear from the, the, the post 50s to post 60s are much better than the post 70s. Post 70s is much better than the post 80s, and we expect the post 90s will be even worse. Okay? Uh, that was the, the, the findings. But let me explain to you that there are two major factors for slowing down. One is economic growth. Okay? For those who are born in the 1940s, when they are aged 20 to 29, which is in the 1960s, at that time, the average real GDP growth per year is 8.7% in Hong Kong. This is Hong Kong today. For those who are born in the 50s, people like me, and uh, by the time we graduate from university in the 1970s, our economic growth is rapid, 8.9% per year. Okay, real growth. In fact, if you take on inflation in the, in the 70s, 70s and 80s, it can, the GDP, nominal growth, can be up to 30% because you have two-digit, double-digit uh, inflation at the time. It's the 60s, born in the 60s, by the 1980s, it starts slowing down from 8.9 to 7.4, and it is in, in by 1990s, it dropped to 3.5%. Uh, by 1990, in the decade of uh, the turn of the century, it's like 4.1%, uh, because uh, partly because of GLR, and <laughs> people increase in, in, in the latter part of the uh, decade, uh, the rapid increase, and and also because they have that deflation in, in, in period. So in terms of real GDP growth, within that 10 year period, it's slightly higher than the 1990s. Okay, but it's slightly higher. So that is one of the reasons, okay? Because eco economic growth is slow, slowing down. So, so opportunities are reducing. Okay? The second thing is, again, demographic. It's because of change in the demographic structure. Let me, let me show you the, um, the uh, census interactive thing, okay? Let me see, this is 2001. Let's go back to uh, 1970. Let's take, start from 1971. It's like a spearhead, okay? This uh, age parent is a spearhead. Imagine at that time, you are 20 to 24 years old, okay? There are not a lot, lot of people older than you, which basically means that not a lot of people have more experience than you, okay? Which basically means that if an economy grows, your, your promotion prospect is high because there are not a lot of senior people as compared to your age cohort, people like me. I, I promote very quickly, okay? Uh, I work in a bank when I graduate, and uh, the, the promotion is every 
one rank every year. It's a very quick promotion prospect. And it's great at that time. But it's so great, it's frightening, so I left to go back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a joke. Okay. Uh, let's, let's take a look how it changed over time. It's just moving up. Okay? Just moving up. The age cohort. Now is 2011. Now, if you look at, if you are unfortunately here, there are a lot of people above you <coughs> with a lot more experience than you. And the economy is slowing down too. So, what are the promotions prospect? There's still a lot of people with more experience than those young adults, and they haven't yet been promoted. Okay. So, one of the uh, hot topics we talked about recently is about extension of retirement age, which is basically a dynamic in Hong Kong. If the, if this group of people like me are not going to retire, how can they be get promoted? Okay, but then when we retire, the, the, the labor force starts to shrink, starting from the year 2018. Five years down the road, our labor force starts to shrink. So you can't allow people to retire that early, <laughs> uh, five years down the road. Okay, now it's still expanding slowly, but five years down the road, our labor force will start to shrink. Then, but then if you don't allow these people to retire, how can this group people get promoted? Okay. Either you have a faster economic growth, okay? But nobody expecting that to happen in Hong Kong in years to come, okay? We probably even slow it down. So, so the, uh, if you just look at the demographics, it is pessimistic, <laughs> okay? This is another way of quantifying it. Uh, this is a ratio of those age 25 to 59 over those age 20 to 24, which basically calculate the ratio of people who have more work experience than the younger adults. Okay? This is very indicative of the trend in the past and in the future. The trend is going down. Okay? This 1961, 71, um, the, the ratio of those with high experience versus those to young adults the ratio drops, which means the lower the ratio, the higher the opportunity. So, in fact, the best time is the 80s, in the 80s, the post 60s, in demographic sense. Okay, in demographic sense. And in fact, they still have 7.8% per annum economic growth at that time, in the 80s. So, so with the best, okay, uh, opportunities, because the ratio is low, but then, since then, it's going up. Here we are. It's still going up. Still going up until 2031. By the time we probably have uh, more university spaces than students, okay? <laughs> and uh, uh, because our, our strengthening of our young population at that time, but then, uh, and then it drops quickly, okay, and then it goes up a little bit, okay. So, but it will never come back to the 70s and 80s, where the promotion prospect. It's much higher. Okay. That's in, very indicative of what the young people in Hong Kong are facing right now. Okay. Okay. So, in a macro level, there's hardly anything we can do in social policy for demographic changes. Okay. Although we, we can do something about population policy, uh, but then it's very difficult. You can't kill all those older people with experience. So to allow those younger people to promote faster. Okay, you can't kill that. Okay, there's no <laughs> no way you can do that. Okay, uh, so next year I'm going to retire. I, I have announced that I'm going to retire next year. Anyway, <laughs> uh, probably I'll, 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 I'll change it into a part-time job uh, because still I I'm still consider myself very young. <laughs> but 60 is is a, uh, we call ourselves a young old. Okay, uh, so the intervention is primarily in the economic areas, okay? Uh, either you're working on economic growth, you have not much room, but then you're talking about economic structure, which is uh, mostly there's basic consensus in Hong Kong that our economic structure is too concentrated in just a few industries. And we need to diversify our industrial structure so that it gives you more opportunities for young people, okay? 
So I, I think there's hardly any debate there. The problem with this idea is that this idea is purely conceptual. We actually have no empirical data whatsoever internationally on about economic structure and opportunities of development for young people. This is unfortunate. Okay, but that is a general impression because if you look around some of our neighboring uh, uh, places like Taiwan, Singapore, particularly Taiwan, uh, you can say that uh, uh, because the, the diversification of the economic structure helps, okay, particularly for young people. Uh, particularly in Taiwan, the creative industry has been working very well in the past uh, 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 five to ten years' time. It's been working very well. So, in the intervention and micro level, okay, so we primarily focus on creating more equal opportunity. When I say more equal, it doesn't mean equal. It's hardly equal. My example is about social capital is the crucial difference between those who have and those who have not. My example is my own daughter. Uh, that was, she is uh, uh, 20, 27 right now. Uh, after she, she, she left high school, she told me uh, that I want to be a journalist. So I said, okay, uh, would you like to work in the uh, South China Morning Post for the summer? She said, yes, okay. I called up as chief editor and, and she got a summer job in uh, South China Morning Post. Out of the summer, she said that I, I think I, I'm not suitable as a journalist. So uh, I, I, I think I should better be an architect. And so she, she moved on to study architect. After the first year, she came back to study elsewhere. She came back and said, you want to work in architecture firm for summer? She said, yes, why not that? So I get her an architecture firm, and we work in the summer. After the summer, and she said, that I finally decided I shouldn't be an architect after working there for a summer. I want to be an engineer. So she <laughs> moved on second year, changed her concentration to engineering. She came back again the second year, and I said, you want to go to an engineering firm? As she said, oh, oh, thank you, Dad. I changed my mind already. I wanted to go into biological science. <laughs> so, so, so that year, she, she went into biological science. In fact, it wants, if she went want to go to law, she went to go to I can always call a few friends and get her some internship. That is called social capital. Professionals, because I have a lot of university of friends in my students' years. They are my buddies. I can always call them up. I, have, I know practically all specialties in medicine. I know I have friends in practically any profession. And I get so, so many friends to help my kids to develop. But the poor, the low income families, they don't. they don't even know what kind of facilities a library can help the children. They don't even know how the school can actually help the children because they don't even have time to go to the parents' day. So, so that is very different in terms of social capital. We're trying our best to make it more equal. So you, you hear about a lot about mentorship, uh, which is basically borrowing <laughs> the, 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 the social capital from the mentors to get more insight, more networks, to help the, the families from low income families. So human capital, you all know, is training and, and things like that. Financial is really resource and money. Okay? So we have the Child Development Fund. The one in Hong Kong is uh, is not really a lot of money. It's only a few thousand dollars. At the end, it's like uh, slightly uh, over twelve thousand uh, dollars saving. Uh, but in the United States, in uh, in uh, in UK, they have a, a child development fund which starts saving from the day they're born when they go into college and the, the money they have to save throughout their life will be able to enable to them to go to college. Right? So, so that is financial capital. Uh, strengthening uh, support to low-income families with children, I mentioned that, and uh, strengthening of the child development fund. I'm, I'm, the details I'm not going to spare up, but I talked a little bit about uh, the, the, the equal opportunity at the, at the education level. Uh, for those secondary or lower level, okay? I mentioned about we have a student finance uh, assistance agency. Uh, you all heard about the textbook uh, uh, subsidy, actually okay? for textbook subsidy. It has two components in fact. One component is uh, packed at the rate of textbook inflation. 
Okay, so it's basically equal to the average average cost of textbook for each academic year for different grades. Primary one to primary six, secondary one to secondary six. Okay, they are packed with the average textbook list price. Okay, but there's another grade which is called the, the flat grant. The flat grant is up to the discretion of the family. Uh, it is used to be for some uh, uh, learning related expenses, but it's not much. It's one thousand and fifty four dollars right now a year on, on full grant. There's a lot of room we can improve it. Okay, increase that amount. The second part is the internet access subsidy. It's right now is thirteen hundred per family, uh, which is sufficient for internet access. But how can you have internet access with a computer? Okay, they need a computer to have internet access. That amount is not sufficient for computer plus internet. And even if they buy the cheapest one, in fact, well, $1,300 is sufficient for a package of internet access to using uh, iPad mini. The lowest cost for iPad mini plus internet uh, uh, option is Wi-Fi only. Uh, is eleven hundred per year. Okay, so thirteen hundred is sufficient, but you don't expect a child to use a iPad Mini to do all his home or her homework. Okay, so a desktop or, or, or a, a, a netbook, that kind of uh, computer is sufficient, but the present level uh, is not sufficient for that. That requires some strengthening of the internet access subsidy to 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 make it more what we call more equal. Uh, that's what we call e e learning support. How we can, can enhance it. The, the the second learn is to strengthen the school based and community based other learning experience for low income families. Other learning experience is growing more and more important for children's learning. Although it's not equal importance academically, but it's growing more and more important. And particularly for, for, for enhancing experience, enhancing the horizon of young people, uh, young children, that kind of other learning experience are, are very important. So we need a, a lot of strengthening in that area. At post secondary level, uh, we, we talk a lot, lot about skilled labor training and upgrading, which is basically vocational training. Uh, the, the, the problems we have is not purely an issue of training, it's an industrial issue. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of industry where you don't have sufficient labor. Okay, high, high shortage. They are reasonably paid. But the problem is, is the packaging. Okay? No parents will be willing to send their children to learn how to repair cars. Okay? In Hong Kong, in Cantonese, we call them tefong jai. So they will all very dirty after work. Okay? But if you're working in Dai Che, or you're working in uh, Kram, or you're working on um, Yang Fu, whatever, they come up clean. Okay? It's very different. Okay? But there are only a few. There, there are over a thousand garage right, in Hong Kong, and they all come up dirty. No parents, that the image is all deep hard, and nobody wants the children to work there. There are a lot of things like lift maintenance. Uh, you know, heard of all the scandal things. <laughs> A lot of the state also have difficulty of recruiting students for the maintenance. So there are a lot of quite a good number of these industries we fail to attract sufficient young people to join them. Uh, we need repackaging. In fact, the construction industry has tried to do it uh, quite, we uh, we'll say reasonably well, repackaging to make it sound more uh, uh, technical and uh, almost like professional kind of image building. We need a, a lot of things to do to attract people to come to the different industries. The second thing is to support for secondary school, school students or low income families to do two things. At the present moment, any family coming, any children coming from low income families, they're hesitant to do two things. Oversee internship training and exchange is very difficult. Okay, Hong Kong, you see you. Uh, science and technology, they are slightly better because they have provided some support for this in internship and training and exchange. Uh, but it's still far from sufficient, particularly when, the, when you look at the low income groups. Uh, I, I met, well, students coming from different universities in the, in the past few months, 
And uh, one thing is to examine what kind of thing they need. And this is one of the things, overseas internship, because they have problem. Uh, although the, the university, like uh, Hong Kong University, may be able to provide them the airfare, uh, the, the hostel fees, etc. But then the daily living expenses is a big problem. The living, daily living expenses is expensive, and also they can't do part-time job when they're overseas. While they're in Hong Kong, they can do part-time jobs. So, so coupled with the loss of opportunity, loss of part-time jobs income, and also more expensive living expenses elsewhere, most of these students won't join these overseas programs. They won't join, they don't live in hostels either. But, but to me, living in a hostel is a very important social capital development. Because if you live in a hostel, your lifelong friends most likely will come in from the same hostel, same dormitory. Okay? They will be your close friends almost your whole life, whole lifetime. And that is a very crucial learning experience and also social capital building. But low income families won't do that. Because it's expensive, and particularly I, I met a, a, a student uh, in Chinese University. He lived in Yunnan. He has a transport subsidy of $9,000 a year. It's quite reasonable, okay? But if he lives in a hostel, he lost that $9,000. He, 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 he doesn't spend all the $9,000. He actually spent only like $3,000 and he took the other $6,000 to support himself. But then, if he lives in the hostel, there's no host, no transport subsidy. At the same time, he had to pay the hostel fee, which is well over $10,000. Okay? So they don't live in hostels. So they're trying to think about how we can provide better support to this family, children, so that they can have a choice. I'm not saying they must live in hostels. They have a choice to live in hostels. And they have a choice to go overseas for internship, training or even exchange. I've been advocating the loan system restructure. Okay? Uh, one of the problems in our loan system, government loan system, is that 60% of those who are eligible for full loan, they don't even apply for it. 60% of those who are eligible for full loan, they do not apply for it. Why? Two reasons. Simple one is that they think that it is not not a virtue to let to borrow money from the government. Okay. Secondly, which is fundamental, which is a risk. Well, conceptually, I, I, let me translate into the economic sense. It's called the last one is the risk in high education investment. And you understand very very clearly. It basically is that if it's, let's say you study associate degree. You pay uh, $50,000, $60,000 uh, fees, but then after you graduate, you earn $8,000 a month. Okay? You accumulate a debt, uh, a debt of, uh, of over like uh, uh, $100,000 loan or even up to maximum like $200,000 because you study some degree and then a degree. And, and then when you graduate, you earn something less than $10,000. And how are you going to repay the loan? Okay, and they've been have been low pay for a long time. Okay, that is the risk of investment. But imagine you get a government job, a EO, or a teacher's job. Your starting salary is like uh, twenty three to twenty four thousand dollars a month. You'll be willing to pay a little bit more of your loan. But if you're only earning eight thousand dollars, then we pay on the, of a loan is a big problem. Okay, because they probably need to support the family at the same time. Right? Not just for themselves, they have to support the families. So investing themselves in high education is a risk. And, and I've seen students who, 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 who ran out of the classroom immediately after class for part-time, overnight jobs, and they look so pale. And I, I, I do, well, one of the students I met, I, I, I wonder his mental health is severely negatively affected. And uh, because of pressure, the, the stress the student has facing uh, is so enormous. Okay? So that is unusual. But when I look at students who, who, who are willing to, to apply for the full loan, actually they live quite much better. They can participate in university life. 
uh, for those students who don't fear about those risks, particularly like those who are studying, say, nerves, okay? They're very sure that after graduation, unless they can't graduate, if they graduate, they will earn something quite reasonable and very stable jobs. And the promotion process is not too bad. So why not full loan, okay? They're very sure they can repay the loan. But for those who are studying social science, arts, and uh, uh, pure arts or creative art, whatever, okay, how can they be sure that when they graduate, they're able to pay the loan comfortably? But if that is be a serious about higher education, if it's serious about helping those students to, to, to go through that social mobility, we need to help them. So my advocacy is to reform the loan system so that to reduce the risk. In fact, in the UK system, you don't have to pay back the loan until you earn a certain level. In the Australian system, your, your repayment of the loan is tied up with your amount of earning. The more you earn, the more you pay. Okay? In fact, both systems is mirrored after an experiment in Yale University years and years ago. The Yale University IT system of giving a loan to students and then the, the repayment of the loan is based on the earning level. And it is proven that then the loan take up rates check up very quickly. Okay? And then they were able to repay. The argument is that some people say, why don't you just give them money instead of, of lending them money? But that is very controversial uh, because they're considered to be adults. And in, in the community, there are people who say that, oh, when I was a university student, I, I, I study hard and I work hard, I, I do a, a tuition and etc. etc. Et and I work on part time job. Why should we uh, uh, give, just give money for the low income families, children to study in, in, in a degree? They should take their own responsibility. So that has been going on. I, I don't want to spend my time arguing on, on this particular point. But I think there are good examples around the world to improve the system so that we reduce the risk, so willing to, to, to borrow money from the government, and they can make better use of the university education. In fact, for those who don't pick up the full loan, they can't actually make full use of the university education, because most of the time, it's actually spent on working, rather than studying, or other learning experiences within university systems. So that is, to me, a very important thing, that we need to reform the system so that the people are willing to obtain a loan and live reasonably okay. okay? But I'm not against people doing part-time jobs, but they shouldn't be working three or four part-time jobs. They shouldn't be leaving the classroom and rush to, to part-time till midnight. Okay? They need to study and they need to participate. And, and that's my, my, my... So my closing remark, I probably spent too much time, uh, overrun very too much. Uh, there's no quick fix for poverty alleviation. Okay, there are a lot of lot of problems. Our system is so complex and beyond comprehension. Uh, I, I I I consider myself an expert in this area, but I I admit I there are a lot of things I don't really understand within our system, and uh, requires alignment and in the long run integration. And uh, my suggestion is always incremental approach, but with a long term vision in mind so you know where the direction you should go to, okay? But a, 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 a big bang approach is impossible in Hong Kong. You know, in Hong Kong it's very difficult to, any, to do anything within the government anyway. So, so even for poverty alleviation, we need to do it incrementally, but then always bear in mind what should be the long-term goal. I'm sorry, I spent too much time on the policy. Thank you very much indeed for your... Uh, this time you have a clock over there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> your, no, it was very interesting. So uh, uh, your very comprehensive uh, dissertation on uh, our, 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 our poverty and disparity issues. Uh, somewhat pessimistic, I think. Uh, um, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, there is plenty of things to prove for, uh, for us here uh, tonight. Um, and it's a little bit alarming that the system is so complex that even you don't know uh, every uh, offering that is there for people in terms of government help. Um, 
So I think now we've got some time for questions, and uh, I'm uh, going to uh, start off with the first question, uh, and, and that is, um, do you think that we should be using minimum wage more emphatically as a property remediation tool? Simple answer, yes. Okay, uh, it's definitely, yes. We get, our minimum wage is far too low. Uh, I, I hesitate to say, well, if, if someone who knows me a long time will probably know that I'm very hesitant about the minimum wage at the very beginning uh, for two reasons. Firstly, it's because if you, if you target the minimum wage at a reasonable level, the economy will have a big shock. But if you target at the minimum wage as the level as it is now, then it will take a long time to become a reasonable minimum wage. And, uh, and it's so difficult. Once you start in a low rate, the bargaining is, will be tremendously difficult to make it reasonable. I, I still consider the present minimum is just too low, but politically very difficult to move it up. Yeah, like, like you, I was also uh, very, very much against minimum wage. In fact, I remember one time sitting next to Martin Lee and congratulating him on the Democratic Party because they were against minimum wages. This is very, very sensible, very that's responsible. The, the decision was made in 1999. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, but, but, but when I saw that uh, Oxfam report on, on uh, the increase in poverty in Hong Kong, I think it's 2006, uh, that's, that changed my mind totally. Uh, and, and I felt we, we, it's essential to have a minimum wage. I'm very strongly for minimum wage, but I'm fortunately not too many minutes left. Uh, who would like to ask a question? UTC funded programs, 
only providing around 24 to 25 percent of the same age cohort the opportunity of university education, which is by far lowest to com when you compare to developed countries. Okay, they can be like 40 percent, 50 percent. Some even go so hard they claim to be like 70 percent. Okay, uh, but that that is probably too high. And then we have another uh, uh, 40 some, something 40 percent studying sub degrees. Okay? The problem I don't think is about university education. We can actually have room to expand it. The problem is with our sub degree program. Is the proliferation of sub degree programs, which in the past decade has been not very constructive. Uh, Dong Kima has tried to make a target 60 percent of our age cohort to study either sub degree or degree. But then it overshoots of over 64%. And it now is close to 70%. And we, uh, but a few years down the road, we don't have that problem because uh, some of the higher education institutes probably have to shut down because we have insufficient student numbers. <laughs> uh, 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 you, you start, all, all you have to remember of the problem of our education system is starting from 204, we start killing, we sort of quote unquote, killing primary schools, shutting down primary schools. Six years, down the road, 2010, it starts shutting down secondary schools. So by the year 2016, we'll start uh, shutting down high education programs. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that's what going to face, we're going to face it. Uh, the problem is the sub-degree. And also the problem that I mentioned is that the lack of acceptance of, of parents towards vocational training. Uh, because there's a myth that, that if they go to university, they, they will be their gateway to middle class and uh, good life, okay? So if they can't get into university, let's go to an uh, associate degree so they can have the associate degree as a stepping stone to move up to university education. That's most parents want, okay? But then we don't have sufficient people going to vocational training. We have been trying to reform our vocational training in the past few decades all the time, okay? It's getting better and better, but about a little bit too slow. And at the present moment, it's far from uh, desirable in the sense that our vocational training is not sufficiently attractive. So that people, we need those skills, we don't need those people in our, in our community. Pumpers and uh, and electricity, that kind of thing. We we need all that pumping, all this. We don't have sufficient people coming in. So our our present effort in doing uh, in vocational reform is trying to work with the industry because we can't provide vocational good vocational training without good good collaboration with the industry, without the industry itself trying to improve its own image. If the industry is not doing it. There's no good just going to vocational training and then the parents say no at the end of the day. So we need to be informed not just vocational training, but we use vocational training as a platform whereby we will hand in hand work with the industry to improve its image and then its ability to attract quality students coming into vocational training and enter the industry. But it's a long road and it takes a lot of effort. Because industry, because they're competitive in nature, and working in collaboration to try to to improve that. Because I, I mentioned about uh, 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 car repair, and uh, those free, the free bed repairs, okay, they're not willing to work with the other thousand garage in Hong Kong, and they want to pitch themselves in such a level they have no problem of recruiting at, at all. So. So it's very difficult to work with that industry and trying to improve the, the, the packaging and imaging. Uh, but that's a, but, but we're still trying a lot uh, on those, those parts right now. And I'll show you, uh, we were making progress, although the progress is not, not always in the pace that we would like it to be. Perhaps it could take some hints from the police force. At one time, your police members considered to be in the now, now people are queuing up to go into the police force, and they, I'm always out on the street, and I talk to a lot of uh, police officers, and you're getting more and more highly educated police 
offices. Plus the fact they have a, a good job prospects. The guys who come in at this level know that they are going to go up to. Well, this one is easy. You're only one employer. Mm -hmm. uh, for other industry, we have uh, hundreds, like car repair. Yeah. Uh, we have thousands of operators in the community and kind of things. And I, I would say a lot of them should be obsolete. <laughs> but, but then, uh, somehow because of, again, minimum wage. <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we increase our minimum wage, some of those workshops actually will close down. Okay? And then there is much room to improve some of those uh, industries. Uh, and uh, like uh, lift maintenance. In fact, if you work as an engineer and a, 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 a technician in, in lift maintenance, you're earning well over 16000 a month. Uh, but then, because of the competition, subcontracting, then the industry, uh, for some of the uns untrained people, they're still working in lift maintenance. That's why we have so many accidents. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that is a problem in industry. And it's a long way, I have to say. It's not easy, because uh, industries not always working together. Thanks very much for uh, sharing your, your experience and knowledge you know, on a very complex uh, subject with loads and loads of uh, interesting but uh, very challenging information that I think I need time to digest. But anyway, let me ask you a, a question which relates to your capacity as the chairman of the final community care fund. Um, uh, frankly, uh, I know not much you know, except from the media about this fund. You know, and, uh, uh, it doesn't appear that often in the headline, headlines, uh, but uh, I'm just wondering, what, what kind of work do you do? Uh, because some people will describe you as, uh, uh, maybe outsiders, they, they describe you as the uh, proxy of the government. You are doing the uh, dirty or good work for the government without going through the let go and, and all that, you know, which would be a lot of trouble for the government. So that's why they, they, uh, they come up with this uh, device, right, the community, uh, the, the in order to get around, you know, all these uh, red tape bureaucracy and uh, and uh, really um, put the money where where it's needed and fast, you know, which is a good thing, you know. But I'm just wondering, uh, back to my question, uh, do you have a strategic uh, plan or guidelines as to how you're going to use the fund, or do you mainly react so far on an ad hoc and a reactive basis, you know, for example, if there is a tra tragedy or something, or then then you, uh, you know allocate certain amount of funds to it and without any long term or medium or, or objective at this time, you know. So can you familiarize us with that? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, but the, the, but it was uh, slightly more than two years ago mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Donald Trump mentioned uh, to set up the community care fund. Uh, I have to tell you my first reaction. I think it's a dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, that, that the, the reason is that there are two reasons. One reason is uh, no government in this world, uh, apart from taxing people, will ask people to donate money. Okay? It's, it's a volunteer sector work. Okay? The third sector work. It's not the government's work. The second thing is, oh, okay, let's go back to the first thing. It, because there's a seesaw in that. If a government uh, 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 asks people to donate money, that person will donate less to the NGO sector, which is a seesawing effect. Although the government at that time denied it, but basically it was actually happening. So my first intervention is when Henry Tan called me to help in this community care and I said, you have to stop fundraising. If you don't stop fundraising, I won't do this one. Okay? So officially, we were still asking, uh, we are welcome to donate, okay? This official line, okay? You are welcome to donate. But we are not actively seeking donation. Second thing is, as you mentioned, it's a back door. Constitutionally, it's a problem to me, particularly at the time when I heard about this idea. And I said to actually Henry Tang at that time, he was the chief secretary, I said, but well, this is basically a back door. You don't need the scrutiny of the, of the let's go. Although we understand there are problems in let's go in dealing with uh, government spending because it's almost like, as I mentioned, it's like Bosworth. When the government proposes something, 
It's like Christmas Creek. And everybody add on, add on the things and demanding more and more from the government. Uh, but then, but somehow in a constitutional structure, the, the primary function, one of the functions, I would say, one of the primary functions of the school is to ensure that the government is spending money in a right way. Okay? But bombing money into the community can actually take away some of the constitutional responsibility of the legislature. Okay? That's why the Democratic Party is against the community government injection of uh, $15 billion. And uh, Wong Yuman said uh, the reason that uh, the, the Democratic Party uh, is against it is because I'm, I'm the chair of the task force <laughs> <laughs> to, to distance the, the, the whole thing. But it, it's fundamental. But then, the reason I really to pick it up, uh, to be the uh, chair of the executive committee at the time, uh, uh, Henry Tang's time, is that uh, I think, well, I can always make full use of this community government for policy reform. So we are not doing anything. There is, there's some exce one exception. We are not doing anything at hoc in nature, or trying to uh, the, to to patch things which are coming out of urgency, uh, some tragedy, we, we never do that, okay? We have funds for that purpose, okay? We don't need the community care fund for that particular purpose. So the main function of the community care fund is now, is basically trying to do things which con we consider as part, in terms of policy, is something that we find acceptable. But in order to have the policy change, it will take time, firstly. Secondly, there are always arguments for and against a policy change. It, but both of the arguments are theoretical rather than empirical. And we have a lot of international experience for doing anything at all. So what we can do is use the community care fund to pilot some of those improvements in our systems. To shut people off. You say there are a lot of people criticizing initiatives. You can always imagine thousands and thousands of downsides and the positive things. But in, in a context of Hong Kong, you have to try it out. And then in a, in a, in a relatively small scale, and uh, doing more simpler way, instead of doing a very elaborate way within our government system. So although it's still a backdoor, but somehow we can push for earlier policy change by studying pilots. Because there are policy of reforms we've been debating like decades without moving a single inch in our social policy. With the community care fund, we were able to do some of those reform in, in a way of pilots so that we can try it out. So in fact, most of the programs of the community care fund, the thinking is not, well, as we say in the public, we don't we actually say that oh we, 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 we are trying to help people who are not, not within the safety net. So we can patch the system to help them or even for so some of them within the state in there, the system to them is not sufficient. So we try to improve on it. But in fact, whenever we're doing thinking about this way, we're thinking the opposite direction. We're thinking about how can we amend the current system? How the current system should be amended? And see how we can do it in the interim to give us more evidence so that it's much easier to change the policy after the community effort. So so we will start, the starting point is policy reform and then move it backward and then think what can we do now. So the purpose of the community care fund is to spearhead some of those policy initiatives by using it in a less committal manner because it's not a public program, government program per se, but just a community care fund program. So at the end, there is always a possibility if we fail to achieve what we aim at at the beginning, we can always withdraw it, shut it down. Uh, but if we find sufficient evidence that is, is good, and also ways to, to get around some of the problems, uh, for all systems, all solutions create problems. We try to solve problems by creating solutions, but then the solutions itself will create some problems. So it, the best strategy is to try it out and see what are the problems it has created. Because the most difficult part of policy change is how to predict public reaction in terms of their own behavioral change. Uh, uh, if it, 
You probably heard that we, we will be piloting, starting from next year, a saving uh, a scheme for people on CSSA. How the human behavior actually works under a saving scheme is very speculative or theoretical at this present moment. And, and we all know that human beings do not always behave rationally. So it's a mixture of rational and rational reaction to a policy we have to take. It's easier to predict rational behavior, but it's very difficult to predict irrational behavior. And so we need to consider what kind of things we we have to look out when we start reforming system. So that is the major role of the committee effort. It has a minor role uh, because the, the government is doing all these kind of uh, relief measures every financial year. I personally against it. Uh, I, I don't think the government should be doing all this all the time. Uh, but then, because the government is helping those who are on CSSA, those on public rental housing, so we come up to have a group of people we call end nothing people. And uh, so when, whenever the government is helping people to do this relief measure, then the community heaven will try to find these end nothing people and help them. Okay? Which to me is not the primary function of community heaven. But it's political, primarily. So that is an initiative. Uh, with that reform, we hope in the long run we reduce the number of CSA recipients dependent on the CSA for a long time. Uh, there's another initiative coming out. Uh, I'll be doing a lot of the consultation work uh, in, in the coming few weeks' time. It's on the, what we call the elderly care allowance. Uh, the, the carers who care of elderly. So we call them elderly care, but they're not elderly. <laughs> they're carefully carrying uh, the elderly. Uh, care allowance for needed families. Not everybody is targeted towards the low-income families. Uh, one reason is that because a lot of low-income families, uh, they, they couldn't earn a lot anyway. But then they have to spend full time looking after their elderly, say, parents. And, and because of that, their financial condition is very poor. So we need to help this family. Uh, but then, uh, Providing a carer allowance is quite debatable, both in terms of ethics, uh, about family responsibility, or uh, why they should be helping people to look after the family. Uh, there's a debate on it. But internationally, we're, we're moving to that direction for one fundamental reason. It's because every developed country finds it very difficult to employ people to look after elderly in residential care or community care. So you, you, you provide some kind of assistance to people uh, to, to, to have those uh, uh, looking after their own parents. But because of that debate, we've been debating it for more than two decades and never make a single inch. Now, because of the community care fund, so we can start a pilot next year. Okay? Uh, we have learned it from experience internationally. So we've designed the pilot in a way consistent with the evidence we have found elsewhere so that we 
to reduce the negative impact and maximize the positive impact. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to dwell on what they are, but, but the, the primary purpose of the communication actually in this particular case helps the government to start moving, to make a move. Okay? And at any time they can elevate the draw if it's not this experiment doesn't turn out to be successful. Uh, I can continue naming uh, 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 some of those initiatives as we're moving on. And uh, I did mention another function, which is what we call the stop gap thing, uh, the function of the communicator thing, which is because you probably heard about all the debate about uh, Zhang Zhenhua, our financial secretary, that he is not spending money uh, uh, to, to do things that's necessary. But that is uh, another debate. But the whole issue is the, the basic law and also the what we call the fiscal discipline of our Hong Kong government is a constraint on how it spends money every year, particularly in terms of allocating resources for new initiatives. They have a constraint. Okay? Uh, what the community care fund in the present moment is trying to do is that we we can we can start working on some of the things irrespective of how much the financial secretary can can pour out from his pocket to support new initiatives. We can start off with the community care fund until the day that they can absorb it into the government regular budget. We don't know whether that controversy will be resolved. But then the community care fund at the present moment is doing exactly the same function, which is we will, we will be doing some of the things we already consider. The policy should have changed already, but it needs money. But money is on, 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 on competitive basis within the government. And they are not always on the priority to get the necessary results to do it. So the community that can do those things uh, whenever the government have, doesn't have sufficient money, quote and quote, uh, uh, within the so-called fiscal discipline to do the job. So it has a, a stopgap function at the present moment too. And I personally, uh, so far, I would say, I would say, so far, so good. Uh, and uh, it actually, but people mistaken me as uh, uh, Mr. Guan, uh, because that uh, is Guan Wan Gei Gang, and so they call me Mr. Guan. And I remember once I, I, I took a taxi, and the taxi driver said, Oh, Mr. Law, aren't you have a government car to chauffeur to, to take you around to meetings? No, I'm just a volunteer. And people keep asking me, are you still working at the university full-time? I, I, I am. I'm still full-time <laughs> university uh, staff member. And uh, I practically spend every day um, in a week, five days a week, and, um, and for every day in a, in a, in a government office uh, meetings. Uh, and, uh, and this month, I would, I would have over 10 consultation sessions. For, for different stakeholders, uh, and uh, so I spend a lot of time of doing the job. Uh, and and the reason I spend so much time, I do consider is worthwhile. And uh, there are changes, potential changes in the policy we've been talking and been advocating for a long time. Low income family supplement, I would say, is real, and it's coming up in an incremental way. Uh, we've been talking about it for a long, long time. We said that there are a lot of low-income families out there not receiving CSSA for a lot of reasons. And they are not receiving sufficient support and they are actually in a very, particularly for children, uh, when we talk about this uh, opportunity thing, and they are not actually in a fair situation. And we need more changes in our policy. And community fund actually helps in that whole process. Okay, one last question.
一笪牀嘅，賺好多錢咁，可唔可以即係呢一方面就達到再分配嗰、那個嗰、那個嘅作用？我想達到即係呢個貧富懸殊嘅減少。你點睇咧 ？Well, I'm definitely for tax increase. There's a social welfare. <laughs> but uh, at the present moment, I don't see a need for tax increases. We do have sufficient money to work to do a lot more. Uh, without increasing the tax, we still have a lot of room. The problem is how we use our resources. Uh, we, in our tax system, there are a lot of reforms can increase our revenue without actually increasing the tax rates. And there are a lot of considerations about increasing in tax which consider to be fair international. Let's take a very simple example. Dividend tax is the one I've been advocating for some time. Uh, you know, you know, in the US system, uh, Obama find it quicker when, when those rich guys are paying less tax than the secretary. And you know the simple reason is because they don't have salary income. They have dividend income. They have a lot of dividend income. They are not paying tax at all. Now, uh, the, the reason that we don't have interest tax and dividend tax is because of the logic that they are double tax. Because the dividend is below the line. It's after tax. Okay? Interest is your earned income and your income is taxed already. So interest is double tax. That was the reason in the 70s and 80s that many countries, including Hong Kong, had dropped all those dividend tax and interest tax. But it's now coming back internationally. Why? Because they see that it's a problem. It's very difficult to tax on wealth. Okay? There's only one single case last year. The country you know, Cyprus, then is going to bankrupt and they tax on wealth. But, but it's almost impossible politically and morally is debatable. But a tax on income generated from wealth is reasonable. Although this, it, it should work in the same way as earned income tax. We have uh, what we call allowance, tax allowance. Simply, like a retired person, they probably rely on their, their living on dividends. But then they should have a tax allowance over and above uh, 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 $20,000. Dividends should be waived in terms of tax, but then vote for that to start taxing it. Uh, UK has been doing it for some time already, and the US reform is trying to come back with this kind of income generated from wealth to in order to tax them. And that generates a lot of revenue already without changing our basic tax rates. Uh, we can change our standard tax rate without actually increasing it uh, because. People earning two million dollars, they are not unwilling to pay 0.5 percent more. The problem we have the much highest margin of tax rate, very low, which is 17 percent. But then when they earn over 1.6 million dollars, they actually drop to the standard tax rate, which is 15 percent. Now, so that is, we have a lot of room to improve our existing tax system to generate more revenue without actually increasing our tax rates. So I think the first thing what we should do is to reform the tax system to increase the revenue before talking about tax rate increases. Uh, if even now we have sufficient money to do a lot more, the problem the government is not using the money in a, in a reasonable way to make full use of it. Well, CK, on that rather revolutionary note, um, mm -hmm. perhaps we should bring the proceedings to an end. And thank, thank you very much indeed. And if you want to ask your question, you better come up straight.